Afternoon, everyone. I'm Francis Pritchard. I'm the City Trust Secretary, Honorary Secretary. And I'm here because John Lowe, who is our chair, is currently uh, under the weather with COVID and, and can't unfortunately be with us. So I understand he's here on, on Zoom. Uh, it's good to see lots of people here. And uh, on behalf of the Trust, I welcome you to the, to the spring lecture. Uh, housekeeping. There are fire exits at the back of the room and here to, the, to, to my right. Um, toilets are on the ground floor. Uh, and can people at home please turn off their microphones? May I introduce John Gluas? John is the director of the Durham Energy Institute. He's a geoscientist with 28 years in industry and 12 in academia. The first part of his career was in the petroleum industry much of it being associated with improving our understanding of the subsurface and the relation between rocks and fluids, water, oil, and gas contained therein. Recognition of the impact of petroleum usage on the atmosphere and hydrosphere, along with the realization that the earth could deliver much more than fossil fuels and do it in a sustainable way, led to a career change to academia. And here he is. <laughs> uh, Francis, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation today. Um, I'm a little daunted looking at the audience here. I do hope um, uh, I'm able to uh, provide you with some entertainment as well as uh, a little um, uh, information. What I was asked to do is, is both look backwards and look forwards in terms of uh, Durham Energy. And being a geologist, I thought I'd best start at the beginning. And I will if I could get the uh, next slide up. There we go. So Sting sang, One World is Enough for All of Us, but probably not quite right. I would suggest that um, uh, we need the sun and also the moon. And if we start to look at those and the way in which both they formed and have evolved, then we might be able to do a little bit better on energy than perhaps we've done in the past. Let's just set some context. Uh, so the Earth is old, but it's only a fraction as old as the universe and indeed our own galaxy, the Milky Way. But the Sun, Earth and Moon all weighed in at about four, four and a half billion years ago. It didn't take that long in geological time before life emerged and the first signs are in rocks some three and a half billion years old. And indeed that life, if uh, uh, when it comes to an end and gets buried within sediments, some of it, a little of it might be turned into petroleum. And the oldest petroleum lock, rocks or locks are about 2 billion years old. Most are much, much younger, even down to just a, a couple of million years or so. The old rocks are only preserved in little bits and pieces around the globe. It took another billion and a half years or so before land plants emerged. Uh, and land plants with their uh, woody stems and other tissues uh, don't follow the same route when they get buried and heated. They don't turn into liquid petroleum as does algae, uh, seaweed and so on, but they will of course turn into coal as well we know uh, here in Durham. Right, sorry, I've gone and whizzed over. So, early man, and please, there, is, there are a few references to man or men here. It's not my particular bent uh, to not uh, represent it as human or people, but you'll see that uh, I've tried to borrow many of the titles for the slides from films or songs or, or books just for a little bit of fun. Uh, and Early Man uh, is, of course, spot. Are you? We've got the City of Durham Trust. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, so I'm just I'm going off, off, off tack. Off track. Anyway, early man, um, a lovely film by um, 
uh, Ardman a few years ago, and no doubt used many times over, <coughs> used the sun and the earth and the moon, because the tides are, are, are clearly an influence from that, and of course life, we burnt wood, we ate food. Industrial man had a switch <coughs> and spent their time, and we are still in that period, of course, in using petroleum and coal. There's a good reason for that. We'll, we'll explore some of the historical reasons in a minute, but coal and oil and gas are incredibly energy dense. You know, it's a lot easier uh, to get your uh, goods up to market in a, a small tuk-tuk with a little in internal combustion engine in it than it is with a bag of carrots and even the most willing of donkeys. The energy contained within that, the bonds, the chemical bonds of oil or gas or coal really deliver a big punch in energy terms. But we now know, of course, that the impact of using fossil fuels is pretty dire. And so I would suggest, as many have done, that we need to get back to basics and start using a little bit more of the other things which are available to us in terms of energy sources. Being a geologist, I thought we, what we might do with the history of energy in Durham is divide it into sort of periods, if you like. And I've called those Cuthbertian, after you know who, uh, Stevensonian, again, after you know who, and both were from Northumberland, but they ended up doing quite a lot in, in Durham. One of my favorite actors is Gina McGee, so why not? We're about, actually I'm slightly older, but it'll do, uh, late 20th century. Uh, and then, well, we'll have a think about what we might call the future. And those times, if you like, those intervals or periods, whatever you like to call them, correspond to basically using uh, the Earth, uh, Sun, uh, Moon and so on in terms of wind, water and biomass, moving into coal, then into petroleum. Uh, and now we find ourselves within the, the energy transition. Were we at one with nature in those Cuthbertian times? Anyone? Well, the picture there shows uh, the lovely wood just around the corner from where I live. Um, but there was a problem with wood. I've dug out uh, some uh, papers to look at what was happening in the sort of 15th, 16th century. The UK, or what is now the UK, was once a heavily wooded island, as you might find uh, now on the, um, uh, what's it called, Vancouver Island over on the west coast of Canada. But it became denuded of its wood as those early men or, and women uh, tore down trees for firewood and planted crops. I hadn't appreciated it before, but by the time we got to around about 15 or 1600, large parts of the UK, and I can't pin this down uh, to Durham entirely, were at the tipping point. Basically, there was an energy crisis. There wasn't enough firewood for cooking or for heating. Now, the thing about heat and flame and fire, when it's used with food, is that it makes those difficult to digest things more digestible. Uh, it releases more energy. Uh, we have to eat, well, we may, yeah, anyway. We have to eat less, I was going to say. And so, what had been a rather taboo uh, activity of tunneling into the earth suddenly changed. And although there had been mining of coal beforehand, it now became fairly mainstream. This paper, indeed, uh, written in 77, and I don't know, Adrian might bring us up to date a little, uh, suggested that it was that absence of uh, firewood which really sparked, and that seems a good term, sparked the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And so let's move on to the second period, uh, the Stevensonian characterized, of course, by what we all recognize as the history uh, of uh, Durham in terms of coal. 
it may have started in small ways such as I'm sure many of you have walked down across Pevens Bridge and seen this little bend as you go uh, just before you reach the bridge itself coming from the uh, south side there's an undercut and if you scrabble around in there you'll find bits of coal. Coal has been dug out from beneath that. Indeed I think there's a picture of the same isn't there in, and in the merch later on you'll be able to get a, uh, that picture for yourself. Um, the value in the mining of coal probably reached its acne in Durham in terms of uh, what it was able to do with it with the development of the Durham Miners Association in the late part of the um, 19th century. I, I chose this flag in particular because I now live um, on the bit of land that was the colliery owner of uh, the New Bransworth Colliery. So I began to think about this um, a couple of years ago and I wondered just how important was coal? There's lots of apocryphal, uh, sorry, anecdotal stories about the, the value of coal in Durham, but how did it really figure? So I've done some sums here, uh, and this is, there's probably a bit too much information on this graph. Let's start with uh, the left-hand side. What I looked at was all the census of uh, UK population data, and I could go back to just after 1800, I think 1811, uh, and I also looked at the same information in terms of population of Durham. And so what I did here was look at the ratio of growth rates of the UK population and the Durham population. So a figure of one on that left hand side means that the Durham population is growing or shrinking at the same rate as the whole nation. And hey, what do we see? For much of the 1800s, even into the 1900s, the Durham population is growing much more rapidly. And we find stories. My name is Cornish. Um, my great grandfather came uh, from uh, Cornwall to the northwest of England as a mite to become a coal miner three generations ago. Uh, if you go back to Cornwall, a little village just outside. Truro, it's full of Lewis's, bizarre. But there you go. Lots of stories. And I nearly, uh, there are some lovely pictures uh, on the internet of Cornish families that have moved to, to Durham. But there are families from all over the place, Ireland and, and wherever. And why are they coming? They're coming just because, in the same way that we see uh, refugees and people from difficult backgrounds wanting to come to the UK today, it was a place of growth. Durham was. Um, really uh, producing a huge amount of wealth. Not much of it might not have gotten down to the youngest, uh, sorry, the, the poorest members of the population, but it was producing huge amounts of wealth. In fact, if you look at, uh, and there, there are different figures, but I found some figures for 1851, Durham had about 0.5% of the population of England and Wales. It was producing 15% of the nation's energy production, 15% of the coal. Wow. And if you add in, of course, the Northumberland coal field and, and adjacent areas, uh, the Northeast uh, was a phenomenal driver, not just of producing coal, but what else did we have? Outing concert. Well, we, we had access, yes, that, thank you, access to iron within the same carboniferous rocks, carboniferous being coal, that you had um, uh, as well as coal. Of course, that uh, only lasted a certain length of time before new and more easily exploited uh, iron-rich sandstones were found in the Cleveland area, and the steel making in large part uh, shifted uh, slightly south, although still maintained in, in the northeast. And of course, that then begat uh, the development of Teesside <clears throat> from the petrochemical perspective. So the natural resources which were recognized and exploited in Durham uh, paved the foundation for a huge amount of wealth uh, for the UK as a whole. I like to think that because 
I love railways, by the way, so this is probably a bit contrived, but because uh, railways were developed here in the Northeast, we can also lay claim to global time. <coughs> if you took a train from London to Bristol and Bristol time was different from London and you arrived at a different time from that which you expected, or even worse, uh, if the train driver in one area was running on London time and the other area running on Bristol time, uh, before signalling was very good, you're in trouble. And so railway time, standardised time across the UK, and standardised time across the UK spread around the globe. The 24-hour subdivision uh, of the globe um, is from the northeast. Where, where else? <laughs> so the other thing I tried to do on here, which was a bit less successful, although in part, um, is I used the Durham Miners uh, Durham Mining Museum information laboriously to copy all the pit names out and then add them up on an Excel spreadsheet. So these are the number of pits that were open uh, in this time period as well. I can't go back any further than this sort of 1825, 1820, uh, uh, sorry, 1875 or, or something like 70, whatever it happens to be. So coal was extremely important, but the end came. Eventually, peak coal production in the UK, 311 million tonnes was 1911, second only to the USA, by which time, of course, the USA had found something else uh, besides um, coal in uh, Virginia and so on. Uh, it had found the oil fields of California. Um, in, in about the same time, California, in brackets, as it were, was the biggest oil producing nation on the planet. Again, huge amounts of value in that. The end was sort of slow coming in many ways. Uh, most people around today will think of uh, what happened in 1984, but the decline had started before the First World War. And it had many elements to it. Uh, John Lowe was kind enough to send me some information on the uh, how do I pronounce this link? Kipi, Kipia? Kipia. Kipia Power Station proposed to sit in the woods uh, just uh, to the north of the um, meander, uh, sorry, in the floodplain, just to the north of the main meander of the River Weir. Uh, a power station, had it been built, uh, would have been larger, considerably larger than the cathedral, and would have taken coal uh, from a connection on the East Coast Main Line. The power station was not built because of uh, activity in this organisation, I believe. But it wasn't the only thing that was going on. Uh, by the uh, early 1950s, the council in Durham at the time had decided that it would get rid of um, the worst slum villages entirely. And they included, and this is a pic, we've, you can do anything these days, can't you? We managed to get a 18 something or other map printed onto tiles, which now are in my downstairs loo. So this is a picture of the wall in our downstairs loo. And the wall itself is another ordnance survey map. It's, it's like putting fabulon onto the wall. It looks lovely until you get a crease and then you, you all square at one another as you're putting it on. And this shows um, a New Bransworth colliery, uh, the railway line which went from Durham up to uh, Waterhouses, it was called the DNS line uh, with an A, um, misspelled because it's the DNS river with two E's because of the deer we have. But that's almost, it's entirely fields now or woods, beautiful woods. Um, many of the villages were entirely removed, some were partially removed, uh, and uh, New Bransworth uh, was one such. And by 1991, uh, the last deep pit closed on the Durham coast, and I think it was 1995 that Monk Wearmouth, uh, someone correct me, was the last uh, deep pit in the northeast to close, um, where you'll now find the Stadium of Light sitting above it. Um, hey, there's, a, there's, a, there's a weird fact. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, in, in the Earth Sciences Department, we, one of the things I also work on besides energy is human-induced seismicity. And would anyone care to uh, name 
what the most important event has been in the recent decades in reducing seismicity in the UK? Go on. Um, Nick, do you want to spit? Do I have to spit before I say the name? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the closure of the pits in uh, the mid 80s. Um, seriously, the incidence of human induced seismicity has dropped off considerably since then. Uh, and had we had seismometers back in the 1900s or 1870s, it would have been uh, even greater. Um, and it's still uh, the most common occurrence of, and they tend to be very, very small, but it's still the most common occurrence of uh, earthquakes in the UK is either on the Great Glen of Scotland between Inverness and Fort William, or down in the former coal mining regions. Just to show how big Durham was, I plotted it in the same scale as a slice out of the North Sea. And where you see the word ensign there, this is the uh, the Norfolk coast, and that green rectangle is the same size as my rather um, rectangular county Durham on the right hand side. And you can see the sort of black line, probably a bit fa too faintly, it wasn't a great slide within um, the green square on the right. Within that black line are all the mined areas, basically everywhere was undermined in Durham, apart from the cathedral and the places, well, um, and Red Hills, yes. <laughs> so. Okay, let's look now, and we've got to take a, a bit of time out of Durham. Uh, as coal declined, the drive, the energy in the UK went somewhere else. It went in large part, uh, what was Durham in terms of uh, an energy capital of the UK split. The oil province, which sits offshore Scotland, was run out of Aberdeen. And much of the gas province of the east coast of England was run out of Yarmouth. I don't think Yarmouth saw quite the um, flood of uh, money coming in that Aberdeen did. Why was Aberdeen chosen? I just love these little bits of, tiny little bits of history where tipping points. So Aberdeen was chosen to be the oil capital because BP built its office in Aberdeen and everybody else followed. But why did BP choose to build its office in Aberdeen? Nope, but pretty good. It's, you're on the right track. Aberdeen had a concrete runway, Dundee had a grass runway. Oh. And so um, the airport was the determining factor. Uh, so Dundee was left with jute, jam and journalism. So the, the impetus shift, but the UK had gone from, the 1970s were a bit of a low point, but basically we'd gone from a massive coal producer with all the, the wealth, again, it didn't trickle all the way down, but all the wealth that came with that to a massive petroleum producer. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is available on the government website, and it shows you the revenues taken by the taxman uh, from the petroleum uh, production. And the tallest of those purple bars annually in whatever it was, 82, 83, is 31 billion pounds. 95% of all the profit generated by uh, the oil companies went to the tax man. It went as royalty, it went as pro petroleum revenue tax, and so on and so forth. In the 1980s, we didn't need coal because we had all this oil. I even suggest that without this huge natural resource in the North Sea, be it in the north of Scotland or the south of the east coast of Britain, our dictionary would be short of one word. 
Thatcher could not have done what she did without this massive uh, income. The irony is, of course, that the person who was probably least likely to wish to support Margaret Thatcher, Tony Benn, was the architect of being able to um, exploit the North Sea. Again, funny how history turns out. Enormous amounts of cash coming in. I, well, maybe two words. I don't think we'd have had yuppie either. Um, I suspect most of this money went on parties in in uh, London, if uh, not Westminster. <coughs> so we've had two overlapping periods when we've had a massive amount of energy available <coughs> to the UK. Uh, one was coal and the other was petroleum. It also meant that we evolved as a nation somewhat differently than others in Europe. Because we had coal, we created coal gas, and every town had its gasometer. Roast, coal was roasted in a poor atmosphere, a damp, poor atmosphere in a uh, fixed furnace. And from that process, you can create what's called syngas. That's the stuff that went in the gasometers. That's the stuff that used to be sent to your house. It was a mixture of hydrogen, methane, some carbon dioxide, because they weren't too particular about how they made it, and even some carbon monoxide, which is why, if you so desired, you could stick your head in the oven and gas yourself. You can't gas yourself now. You can blow yourself up, but not in the same way that it doesn't. The, the methane that comes from the North Sea does not contain carbon monoxide, and therefore, um, although you can asphyxiate by filling a room with methane or even blow yourself up if you have a methane air mixture, you, it's, doesn't, it's not poisonous in the same way that carbon monoxide is. But we had gas, and then we had gas from another source. I do remember my grandmother complaining vehemently that North Sea gas was nothing like town gas for cooking her cakes or whatever it happened to be. Whether or not she was correct, I don't know. But I put two red lines on these graphs. And one shows the coal production from 1855 up until 2005. The other shows um, <coughs> the oil and gas production in the UK, oil in orange uh, and gas in blue. The scales don't matter too much. And what are the red lines? Both are in 2003, 2004. Both, bizarrely, oil, coal, gas, by 2003, 2004, we had to start importing. Before that point, we were completely self-reliant. We may have had a problem in the 1970s with um, the OPEC oil crisis, limiting the amount of liquid hydrocarbons that came into the UK and therefore driving, although we had many fewer cars in the, at that time than we do now, but this event passed uh, without many people noticing. Strangely enough, it was picked up by the Department of Energy and Climate Change. When I first arrived at Durham, I saw this graph produced by the government, which showed the energy gap between what we produce and what we consume growing from this point. I've got a, a screen grab of it. It's gone from the government website, bizarrely. It went very, very quickly. And indeed, I, I, I don't want to be, a, I told you so, but I've been telling governments, all different flavours of governments, uh, since I first arrived. Um, within weeks, I was introduced to the then Energy Minister, Lord Hunt. I said, we've got a growing crisis. We've got an emerging crisis, not so much in oil, because oil is traded around the world, but we have in gas, because gas is, is a much more restricted market. We live in a, a smaller world, much smaller world. And each of those uh, politicians or civil servants has every time I've mentioned it, I think the last time was about three years ago, said, nah, we haven't. We've got, we, you know, gas, we've got three days or so uh, leeway. Um, not a problem. Hmm, maybe. Right. I told you so. Oh, I said I wouldn't say that. Never mind. <laughs> so let's look again. Let's take the big view, the long view, the geological view. Stand back a bit. Now, these figures, I can guarantee one thing about these figures. They're wrong. 
but they serve at least to allow us to tell a story. If you take the current production, uh, sorry, the current consumption of oil and what we know is in the ground on a global scale, we've got about 50 years left. Now, more will be found. Uh, and indeed, the, the, the problem with oil, forgetting the climate, we'll come back to the climate in a minute or two. Uh, the problem with oil is that we found lots and lots of heavy oil. The Faha, uh, which is a big area in southern Venezuela, has got 14 trillion barrels of tar in the ground where oil has naturally seeped to surface and then become biodegraded. It's difficult to get it out, but it's very energy intensive to get it out. For gas, you know, about the same. Coal, we've got substantially more. <clears throat> in fact, I did a calculation again when I first arrived in Durham. The last figures I could find from the National Coal Board were from 1977. But if you took the amount of coal we used in 2010, uh, which was about 50 million tonnes, and divided it into the reserves which were attached to the pits in 1977, a silly song, I know, we had 750 years supply. By closing the coal mines, by 2010, we ended up with one year supply. We produced the same as we um, consumed more or less. Um, no, sorry, it was one tenth of a year, a year supply because we had to import most of it. Uh, the same is true to an extent probably of uh, uranium. Uh, thorium has never been used for nuclear power stations, although it's 10 times more abundant than uranium. What's that? You can't build nuclear weapons with the res residue from a thorium power station. We developed uranium, or everybody developed uranium, really, to drive nuclear weapon production, not uh, energy. So we're sort of running on empty. OK, let's just take a quick look just to remind ourselves why we're in the energy transition. I'm sure we could we could eat that coal and oil and gas out, probably double or triple that time if we so desire. Before the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was around about 280 parts per million. Not a lot. In 2015, we went through 400 parts per million, and now we're about 425 parts per million. And carbon dioxide has been known to be a greenhouse gas for 150 years. Experiments were done in greenhouses uh, on the surface of Venus. Yeah, it's close to the sun, but not hugely close to the sun than we are. The temperature will melt lead. Uh, the gas uh, making up most of the v Vesuvian atmosphere is nearly all carbon dioxide. It traps the heat. And so uh, the amount of we're putting into the atmosphere has grown in line with the global population. <clears throat> Although, of course, it's very in heterogeneous in terms of its distribution and use with the West and Saudi Arabia and Australia and so on, and Europe, uh, consuming or producing much more of that CO2 and now China uh, than um, South America or Africa. So huge amounts of CO2 going into the atmosphere and they are driving the climate change that we're now witnessing. Our own part, this is our stacked CO2 emissions from, first of all, the coal period, and then added on top of that, the petroleum period for the UK. Uh, we played, uh, in historical terms, uh, a big role, although we may be pretty small now in the top 15, or worse, bottom 15, if, depending on the way in which you prefer to look at it in terms of CO2 emitted, um, but we certainly uh, uh, played our part over the ages. And so we find ourselves in a position where we need to move away from those fossil fuels <clears throat> very urgently, uh, and yet not a great deal has been happening over the last few decades, but it has begun to pick up. And so what I'll do now is look at what we can do and what is happening in Durham. And it's, you know, we're flipping back to some of those more long lasting sources. The sun will last for another 5 billion years or so, give or take. Uh, the earth 
left its own devices would take about 90 billion years before it's stone cold. Um, well, we'll use five because by the time the sun's run out of its hydrogen so fuel source, uh, we're all toast anyway. I think that'll do. That'll do for us as a species, certainly do for me. But what I, I'm going to not look at, it, there's too much, there are too many things for us to look at in total. So I'm going to just pick a, a few things, a little bit of solar, a little bit of solar heat, a little bit of light, a little bit of wind. And being a geologist, I like to grub around underground. So we'll think a bit about the heat of the earth. So, you know, we've leveraged, humankind has leveraged its um, uh, energy, its access to energy. Uh, a, again, a manpower, it is a unit, an official unit of six men um, is about equivalent to half a horse. And yet we've got in one Archimedean screw by the um, um, passport office, 1,333 1, horses. Uh, when it's turning, it wasn't turning when I was there the other day. <laughs> uh, and these are sort of uh, energy demands we have in terms of <coughs> gigawatt hours. We think of our own houses in kilowatt hour terms. <coughs> a giga is, of course, a thousand times, uh, sorry, a mega is a thousand times a giga, and a giga is a million times, sorry, start again. A megawatt is a thousand times a kilowatt. A gigawatt is a million times a kilowatt. There we go. And multiplied by time gives you the amount of energy you've used. And we're heavily on the domestic side of things. But we have been pretty good at reducing our overall emissions in Durham. Well, I say we. Actually, most of, much of that comes from the change which has occurred in the UK's electricity generation. The change from... Uh, again, when I arrived here, coal, we're still thinking about by, if not uh, in um, on the floodplain of the Weir, uh, Kings North was going to be built as a power station in Kent. It was never built, but we're still thinking coal and having to capture the CO2 from those coal-fired stations. But what instead has happened, of course, is a phenomenal revolution in terms of offshore wind, a little bit of onshore wind, but then offshore wind. On a good day, a good moderately windy day, don't want it too windy, about half of all the electricity generated in the UK comes from wind, the vast, vast proportion of that offshore wind. And we've gone from a position in which it was extremely expensive to one in which now uh, the cost of offshore wind is half of that, for example, of, of nuclear. The strange thing is that support for offshore wind <coughs> has been from multiple governments over the last 20 years. And yet never once have I heard a politician say, I would like to thank the previous administration for all the good they've done in terms of uh, allowing us to develop it. But it is a phenomenal story. It's getting quite difficult now to improve on that. The other things in terms of um, Durham, or indeed the, the same is true in the UK, is that we've really not done anything on either heat or transport, but what could we do? And I thank Helen and Maggie, Helen Gration and Maggie uh, Bosenkett for this material. So um, we have a baseline uh, in Durham at least of 2008, 2009, and the council rightly is concentrating first instance in decarbonizing itself. Decarbonizing the county is much more difficult because you have to influence people uh, some of whom could really don't want to be influenced. But there are aims and a um, programme in place. And like so many councils in the UK, uh, Durham uh, announced the climate emergency in 2019. And like so many councils in the UK then said, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> um, but as it happens, uh, I was in a, a, a COP26 meeting that we ran at Beamish uh, in November of last year, and the local government chap from Westminster said, Durham, uh, you might be struggling uh, to deliver on your aspirations in terms of uh, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases and um, combating climate change, but in 
comparison with other councils around the country, you're one of the best. So it's like, that was a compliment, but it's like uh, you did awfully well. You're my favourite. You know. <laughs> anyway, right. So we are we have things in progress. Actually, when you come to look at it, and this is a delightful website, you can put this on your phone. It's one of our um, former PhD students who's still very much work linked and working with the Energy Institute. And if you type in MyGrid GB, uh, you'll find a link to um, a site that provides you with, doesn't everybody need this? Every five minutes, it gives you an update of how, how power is being produced in the UK. You know, people can say, and it actually turns out to be very useful for someone like me, because you'll get some plonker saying, oh, we've completely decarbonized so-and-so. -and -so. Well, actually, today we're producing, uh, oh, this minute we're producing. Turn. But look at all those. Wow. All those uh, onshore wind farms, uh, some battery storage, uh, some um, biomass, uh, and, and so on and so forth, and some photovoltaics. And I put some little pictures on there. We'll come back to some of the pictures in a minute. So some of the things that the council are doing are most distinctly working on things like uh, the some of the old greenfield sites to put on uh, now solar panels, solar PV. Uh, there's a lot more that could be done there. Some of it's very difficult because, of course, we've seen subsidies appear and then disappear with uh, the regularity of uh, the local bus service, uh, but the opportunity to install photovoltaics has grown enormously because the price has fallen dramatically over the last five years. And we may even, uh, well, I'll come back to Bishop Auckland in a minute. 100 EV charging points. I think that's definitely in the could do better on the school report. Uh, there's a long way to go. Yeah, we bought a, a, a new second-hand car on Thursday, and we, for a long time, on denied about going electric, but it was just a bit too risky. We're out, not really in the countryside, we're only four miles from Durham, but we decided it, the cost and the, and the risk probably still outweighed, so we went for a, a low, a small engine uh, petrol car. But there are, as we'll see, park and ride, trying to <coughs> reduce the amount of use of cars. And there's even this new try before you buy on the uh, electric van, um, delivery van. Uh, as part of the electric fleet, Durham has one electric refuse uh, truck. Apparently it's proved a bit of a nightmare. Um, I think the cable keeps coming out of the socket. <laughs> But the, the real problem, and this is replicated around the whole country, uh, is <coughs> heat. We take it, we don't tend to notice heat except when it's too cold. <coughs> the whole of the UK um, produces or gets its heat from burning fossil fuels. So 26 million boilers in people's homes. People are like, oh, just turn it down, turn it up five degrees or so. That's supplied through the gas network, of course. That results in 33% of our national CO2 emissions. Uh, in Durham, we're 47%, it's the same. So, you know, a third of our emissions are coming from heating our homes. And uh, nearly all of it's gas, tiny, tiny amount is coal, and a small amount uh, is um, kerosene. But we sit in an area of the UK, which is actually rather warm. The, the inset map on the, the right, which is hidden a little bit behind uh, the, the screen information there, you'll see the different colours. Um, unsurprisingly, red means hot. This is heat flow. It's not a great map. We've, we've improved it considerably, but this is the one the BGS still use. And you'll see two areas which are, are um, rather hotter than the rest. Cornwall and Weirdale through the Lake District. Now, what do they have in common? Who said granite? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, in both areas, there are granites. The granites in Cornwall are Permian in age, about 250 million years. Ours are about 400 million years old, the Weirdale granite. And the Weirdale granite was first discovered in 1961 by the late Professor Martin Bott, 
he'd been doing a gravity survey as a student. At, he wrote his first paper in 1956. He wrote his last paper in 2018. He was in his 90s. Just unbelievable. Um, nearly all of them on Weirdale as well. But he found that there's a, a gravity anomaly in Weirdale. And his boss at the time uh, from Durham, Sir Kingsley Dunham, or Kings to his friends, was also the director general of the British Geological Survey. And being mates, he said, I'll drill you a well. So in Rookhope, a well was drilled in 1961 uh, by uh, the Department of Geology, South Road, Durham. And at about 400 metres, it went from limestones and shales into granite. And it was hot. And that was a surprise. It's been there 400 million years. It's not hot because it's failed. To, well, it has failed to cool down. It's not simply like, you know, a, a pot of a jam on the stove that cools down. But this granite, like virtually all granites, is quite rich in uranium, thorium and potassium. And when they decay naturally, they produce heat. <coughs> that same granite was redrilled by the late Paul Younger in 2004 at Eastgate. And then I uh, worked with Paul and we drilled at Eastgate again in 2010. What Paul was able to prove is that we could flow water through that granite and that the water was warm. Indeed, if we measured the chemistry of the water, and this, it's a bit shaky in terms of uh, the calculations, but that water seemed to have equilibrated at a temperature of about 150 degrees. Now, these wells were only drilled at uh, rook out to about 400 meters, sorry, five or 600 meters, uh, Eastgate one to 998 meters. So it didn't go particularly deep. But what happens if you go a bit deeper or a lot deeper? So we've been working with um, Auckland Castle and then um, Auckland, the Auckland Trust as it emerged since about 2012 when they've, their interest has gone up and down in terms of drilling deep. But really uh, the opportunity to drill in Bishop Auckland to around about five kilometers and produce high temperature steam, plenty of heat, but with temperatures like that power as well is very real. And indeed in Cornwall, in the last uh, two years, two projects have drilled to over five kilometers at United Downs uh, in 2020, and uh, in Eden just finished a few weeks ago. Um, and they've been able to uh, uh, prove the high temperature range up there. And in the United Downs instance, they've done injection tests of cold water and it's, you put the cold water in, of course, it gets heated up. Uh, so you inject fairly shallow, collect fairly deep, uh, and that uh, could um, produce copious amounts of extremely low carbon. There's no carbon dioxide comes out of these systems, unlike some of the Icelandic ones. There's obviously some embedded carbon as you build the, the plant, but essentially zero carbon power. But it's not just that um, deep opportunity which exists. We have 23,000 flooded, abandoned coal mines in the UK. And the temperature in those mines is anything from about 12 degrees centigrade up to about 25, maybe 30. Uh, the hotspot again is on our coastal area of Durham simply because the coal there is deeper. And of course, we've got this higher heat flow. So projects in which we can extract heat from the ground, it's really very simple. And this is exactly how the 3.6 megawatt heating system for Lanchester Wines works. They take warm water out of the ground, they extract the heat, keeps all their wine at the right temperature and return the water to the ground in such a way that it takes a long while to flow back to where it might be reproduced and by which time it's, it's become warmed up. Even better, not operating in the UK at the moment, but even better is what's going on in both Germany and the Netherlands, where things like industrial heat or solar thermal are collected during sunny periods or when industry's operating and that's put into the ground. So for example, the planned mega factory up in Blythe to build lithium batteries will every second of every day produce 100 megawatts of heat. And we've recommended to them, they put that into the Blythe mine beneath their feet so that it could be extracted 
time shifted to winter time and extracted elsewhere. The other thing is, if you're now valuing the water in the ground in the mines, you'll make sure you know where it goes and therefore you'll better manage or reduce the incidence of these small earthquakes because you're beginning to manage what, what you're doing with that water. Projects are going ahead. Lanchester's already in production. I don't claim we had anything to do with the, uh, the initiation of that, but we've certainly helped them um, since then. Many of you will have seen the plans for the Seam Garden Village down on the coast, at, well, at Seam, obviously, um, over a thousand houses. Currently, the mines there are pumped out, otherwise the water would flood down the streets. And that heat being pumped out every moment is around four to five megawatts. So it would be the first housing, new housing estate based upon mine water heat. And it's very cheap to put in with new, very difficult retrofitting, cheap to put in because it's the same as putting in sewage or water or power, you know, and other projects as well. And bringing us right up to date, you can go even shallower. You don't need to go into the pits. The surface of the earth is warm by the sun. And that solar insulation means that the temperature beneath the ground is fairly constant. And here uh, in the uh, wonderful uh, refurbishment of Red Hills, um, the team are drilling wells to take some of that ground source heat. We did have a look if there was any mining beneath them, but understandably, for obvious reasons, there wasn't. So just can we become carbon neutral? I'm not trying to do any balancing the books in this talk today. But I had a student look at this back in 2020. Wasn't, are we recording? No, I'll be careful what I say then. There's a bit of work still required here. But he looked at all the possibilities, whether it was biomass, solar thermal, uh, mine water heat, and, and so on and so forth. And he looked pretty promising that, uh, for the most part, uh, some difficulties on things like transport, but Durham could go carbon neutral by 2050. We do need to look, do things more rigorously though. But there are some real things we also have to unpick. The planning process, which of course is dictated to our council, it's something they get from big, big government, is really not fit for purpose. We've got, in the past few years, we've seen uh, large developers say, can't do the mine water, it's contaminated. Well, you don't, first of all, the particular mine they were talking about, the, the mine water is actually fresher than the river water, and you don't use the mine water anyway, you put it through a heat exchanger and you circulate fresh water. But because of the way the planning works, that was thrown out. And the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, and this is very personal now, but the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the whole of County Durham now are the thousands of pigs right next door to me in New Brunsworth. Yes. Uh, and the agricultural piece, again, seems to be able to completely avoid the planning process, whether or not the planning is, is good or not. But I suppose in a way, the key to success, and I should have added to this, but will be buy-in from the residents and the residents, including the industry and the agriculture. Uh, we all need to do this together. So in, in summary, we've gone through the age of wood and the age of coal and the age of petroleum, and we're looking for a sustainable future. And I was really struggling to come up with a Ian for the future. And I thought, hang on a minute, COP26, who was the first baby born in uh, Durham in 2020? And it was a little girl called Freya Collier. Collier, wow. wow. Two minutes after midnight, we're back to where we started. Thank you.